One-eyed cats, wall-eyed cats, cross-eyed cats, gray cats, black cats, white cats, yellow cats, striped cats, spotted cats, tame cats, wild cats, singed cats, individual cats, groups of cats, platoons of cats, companies of cats, regiments of cats, armies of cats, multitudes of cats, millions of cats, and all of them sleek, fat, lazy, and sound asleep. I looked on a multitude of people, some white, in white coats, vests, pantaloons, even white cloth shoes made snowy with chalk, duly laid on every morning. But the majority of the people were almost as dark as Negroes, women with calmly features, fine black eyes, rounded forms inclining to the voluptuous, clad in a single bright red or white garment that fell free and unconfined from shoulder to heel, long black hair falling loose, gypsy hats encircled with wreaths of natural flowers of a brilliant carmine tint, plenty of dark men in various costumes, and some with nothing on but a battered stovepipe hat tilted on the nose and a very scant breech clout. Certain smoke-dried children were clothed in nothing but sunshine, a very neat-fitting and picturesque apparel indeed. In place of ruffs and rowdies staring and blackguarding on the corners, I saw long-haired, saddle-colored, sandwich island maidens sitting on the ground in the shade of corner houses, gazing indolently at whatever or whoever happened along. Instead of wretched cobblestone pavements, I walked on a firm foundation of coral, built up from the bottom of the sea by the absurd but preserving insect of that name with a light the absurd but persevering insect of that name with a light layer of lava and cinders overlaying the coral. Belched up out of fathomless perdition long ago through the seared and blackened crater that stands dead and harmless in the distance now instead of cramped and crowded streetcars. I met dusky native woman sweeping by, free as the wind, on flat horses, and astride with gaudy riding sashes streaming like banners behind them, instead of the combined stenches of Chinadom and Brannan Street slaughterhouses. I breathed the balmy fragrance of Jasmine Olander and the pride of India. In place of the hurry and bustle and noisy confusion of San Francisco, I moved in the midst of a summer calm, as tranquil as dawn in the Garden of Eden, a place of the golden city skirting sand hills and the placid bay. I saw on the one side a framework of tall precipitous mountains close at hand, clad in refreshing green and cleft by deep, cool, chasm-like valleys, and in front the grand sweep of the ocean, a brilliant, transparent green near the shore, bound and bordered by a long, white line of foamy spray dashing against the reef and further out the dead blue water of the deep sea, 
flecked with white caps, and in the far horizon a single lonely sail, a mere accent mark to emphasize a slumberous calm and a solitude that were without sound or limit. When the sun sunk down, the one intruder from other realms and persistent in suggestions of them. It was trance to luxury to sit in the perfumed air and forget that there was any world but these enchanted islands. It was such ecstasy to dream and dream till you got a bite, a scorpion bite. Then the first duty was to get up out of the grass and kill the scorpion, and the next to bathe the bitten place with alcohol or brandy, and the next to resolve to keep out of the grass in future. Then came an adjournment to the bedchamber and the pastime of writing up the day's journal with one hand and the destruction of mosquitoes with the other. The whole community of them had a slot. Then observing an enemy approaching a hairy tarantula on stilts, why not set the spittoon on him? It is done, and the projecting ends of his paws give a luminous idea of the magnitude of his reach. Then to bed and become a promenade for a centipede with 42 legs on his side and every foot hot enough to burn a hole through rawhide. Through a rawhide. More soaking with alcohol and a resolution to examine the bed before entering it in future. Then wait and suffer till all the mosquitoes in the neighborhood have crawled in under the bar and slip out quickly, shut them in, and sleep peacefully on the floor till morning. Meantime, it is comforting to curse the tropics in occasional wakeful intervals. We had an abundance of fruit in Honolulu, of course. Oranges, pineapples, bananas, strawberries, lemons, limes, mangoes, guavas, melons, and a rare and curious luxury called the cherimoya, which is deliciousness itself. Then there is the tamarind. I thought tamarinds were made to eat, but that was probably not the idea. I ate several, and it seemed to me that they were rather sour that, <laughs> that year. They pursed up my lips till they resembled the stem uh, end of a tomato, and I had to take my sustenance through a quill for 24 hours. Poor Mark. Then sharpened my teeth till I could have shaved with them, and gave them a wire edge that I was afraid would stay. But a citizen said, no, it will come off with the, when the enamel does which was comforting at any rate. I found afterward that only strangers eat tamarinds, but they only eat them once. There was a pitcher by the name of Les Haney who threw about as hard as anybody did, and, and there was an all-star game, and the guy came up and just swung, and swung down the middle, started swinging when Haney wound up, hit a 900-foot home run. The next time up, Haney rolled the ball and he swung it. <laughs> He swings and misses, strike one. Ryan might be able to do yeah. that. Just wind up and then roll the ball. Well, one thing for sure, there's no sense looking for the curveball. You just sit on the fastball, and if he throws it, tip your hat and say goodbye. You know, you'll sit down, especially if you have two strikes. One strike pitch. Fastball hit high in the air to center field, and that's playable for Pettis. He's there to make the catch. Another one, two, three inning. And at the end of four... Okay, here we have chapter 64. An excursion. Captain Phillips and his turnout. A horseback ride. A vicious animal. Nature and art. Interesting ruins. All praise to the missionary. In my diary of our third day in Honolulu, I find this. I am probably the most sensitive man in Hawaii tonight, especially about sitting down in the presence of my betters. I have ridden 15 or 20 miles on horseback since 5 p.m. 
And to tell the honest truth, I have a delicacy about sitting down at all. An excursion to Diamond Head in the King's Coconut Grove was planned today, time 4.30 p.m. The party to consist of half a dozen gentlemen and three ladies. They all started at the appointed hour except myself. I was at the government prison with Captain